What's up guys, TechNab here. Now in a recent video we took a look at the AMD Radeon RX 5600 XT and that graphics card actually surprised me. We revisited that card because it was part of our tech catch up and the AMD Radeon 5000 series was pretty much a whole generation that we missed. And because of how well that card actually surprised me I decided to pick up another one but this time it is the slowest RDNA card, the AMD Radeon RX 5500 XT. Can this card surprise me as much as its bigger brother the 5600 XT? Well there's only one way to find out. Now after our last video where we took a look at the AMD Radeon RX 5600 XT, a card that actually really surprised us when it came to performance, I went out there and took a look to see what I could find in terms of a 5500 XT and I managed to stumble across this one. It is an MSI Mech OC version just like the RX 5600 XT which does mean it has the similar flaws to a budget graphics card particularly the ones that we pointed out in the last video but it did come in mint condition we obviously got the box which they kind of just looks like new it came with everything that the card needed including all of its dust covers and ports and in a previous video to this one we actually tore it down and give it a clean and we'll link that video at the end if you guys want to know how to do that but apart from that the card worked perfectly fine I'm not actually a big fan of the mech OC cards purely because of simple things like the lack of zero fan RPM I kind of tend to think that it's a bit of a waste when the fans are spinning when they don't need to but you kind of deal with what you have at the time and I'm pretty sure these would have been pretty budget models when they were actually released so you can't really complain at things like that. Just like the RX 5600 XT it does come with the requirement of an 8 pin PCI Express port although the power consumption on these are a lot less. It does also have a plastic back plate which actually makes the card look very nice in a system it's a shame that it is plastic and not metal or acting like some kind of thermal pad anyway but it probably doesn't need it for the power of this card anyway. It does have a twin fan system on it just like the RX 5600 XT although the card is actually a little bit smaller than that so it's a nice compact card that would pretty much go in any kind of case. I will admit they're not bad looking cards but they just do lack a bunch of features but if we take a look at the specs of this model in particular we can see that according to the AMD website it has 22 compute units, a boost frequency of up to 1845 MHz and a gain frequency of 1717 MHz. It has 32 ROPS 1408 stream processors as well as a typical board power of just 130 watts. That actually makes this card a pretty decent option particularly if you have quite a low power supply. The minimum recommended power supply from AMD themselves is of course 450 watts so most people should be covered for that. But what cuts really interesting on this card is actually the memory that it has. The memory on this card is an 8GB GDDR6 which is quite impressive really because the RX 5600 XT only had 6GB so hopefully the 8GB on this card actually give it a little bit more punch when it comes to some of those newer titles out there that require that extra VRAM. Now the card itself was a low spec card from AMD particularly when it comes to the RDNA architecture you could actually pick these up brand new for around $199. Now that does sound crazy nowadays because even something like the RX 6500 would have cost just above that when it was actually released. I know the MSRP on that card was around $180 or £180 at the time but because of the GPU crisis you just couldn't get them at that kind of price. You had to pay way more. So in comparison the newer version of this was a little bit cheaper when it comes to MSRP but of course the RX 6500 XT has its own problems which this one doesn't seem to kind of suffer from. In comparison to the other cards of its generation it was a low spec card and its price obviously reflected that because the others were actually quite expensive particularly when it came to AMD graphics cards. If we just compare them up against its uh, faster siblings we can see that compared to the RX 5600 XT and the RX 5700 XT this GPU uses a Navi 14 node. Its interface is a PCI Gen 4 x 8 whereas the others are times 16 but it does have slightly higher clock speeds than the 5600 XT but it does get beaten by the RX 5700 XT. It has way less shaders than the others. The same type of memory as the 5700 XT and about half the bandwidth as the 5700 XT and it only has a memory bus of 128 bit but the real benefit here comes down to that power consumption which is only 130 watts compared to the RX 5600 XT's 150 watts it's not a lot more but it is just enough to maybe push you up to a new power supply and of course it's a lot less than the RX 5700 XT which uses 
a pretty decent 225 watts. Now, of course, as always, we want to see how well this card performs. It was a low spec card from AMD back then. It is still a low spec card now, but how well will it perform when it comes to some more of the modern titles? To find that out, we obviously needed to do some benchmarking. So we've had this on our test rig for about two weeks now. And we've kind of gone around houses a little bit with it, making sure that we give it a fully in-depth test on pretty much every single game. So let's take a look at those benchmarks and then we'll discuss some of the results. Okay, so the RX 5600 XT was a card that super surprised me, particularly when I started benchmarking it. It performed exceptionally well compared to what people had told me. And to be honest, this little card did too. It's not the greatest or the highest performing card out there. And to be honest, if you do own one, you should start to look for an upgrade now, particularly if you want to start playing some of the more newer titles, but it actually did put up a decent fight. We'll take a look at the 1080p results that we got. In games such as Back for Blood, we managed to get an average frames per second of around 91, but it did suffer greatly on those 1% lows, getting under half of that at 42. Cyberpunk 2077, we only managed to get an average frames per second of 38, but the actual 1% lows weren't that bad in that game, particularly compared to the average FPS, which were at about 32. Doom Eternal performed exceptionally well, as it always does, getting an average of 122 frames per second and a 1% low of 90 frames per second, which means that that game performs fantastically on this card. And then quite surprisingly, God of War, we actually managed to get 59 frames per second with a 1% low of 46. Now that was actually quite surprising because even on some of the more newer cards, we've really struggled to get God of War actually performing well. So I kind of think that the extra VRAM on this card compared to some of the others actually really helped that game perform quite well. Red Dead Redemption 2, even though it's one of the oldest games in our test suite, only managed to get around 37 frames per second, but the 1% lows more or less kept up with that, getting an average of 35, which meant the game was actually really, really smooth. 
it's probably just not at the frame rate that you'd like to play it at. Spider-Man Remastered, we managed to get an average of 68 frames per second with a 1% low of 41. That's pretty average for this kind of tier and performance card for that game. It's actually a reasonably decent game that will perform quite well on most things. And then of course we've got The Last of Us Part 1, where we only managed to get an average frames per second of 35 with a 1% low of 21. Now you probably wouldn't want to play that game like that, but for those of you out there that are on super tight budgets, you're kind of going to have to be locked down to that. You will have to drop a lot of settings in that game to really get it to perform anywhere near where you want it to. Now this card is not a 1440p card, but we did do some 1440p testing just because we wanted to see what it could do. In Back for Blood, we managed to get an average of 61 frames per second, but again, those 1% lows were dramatically down at only 25. Cyberpunk 2077, we managed to get an average of 23 frames per second with a 1% low of 19. That kind of meant that the game was not really that playable. You wouldn't enjoy it at all. Doom Eternal performed exceptionally well, just as always, getting an average of 87 frames per second with a 1% low of 61. It still meant that that game was more than playable, particularly in this high quality setting, and the game looked absolutely fantastic when running in that resolution. God of War also performed exceptionally well in 1440p, and again, I can only really put this down to the additional VRAM that this card's got, getting an average of 40 frames per second with a 1% low of 36. Red Dead Redemption 2 played okay on this card, getting an average of 30 frames per second 1440p with a 1% low of 27. Now the gap on the 1% lows when moving up to that resolution did start to widen a little bit but you couldn't really tell. The game was actually more than playable and that was even in some of the most busiest parts of the map. So I kind of class that as a win for the 5500 XT. In Spider-Man Remastered we managed to get an average of 49 frames per second with a 1% low of 30, which actually meant the game was pretty decent and you could actually play it like that, particularly with the type of game it is. And then of course, The Last of Us Part 1, we managed to get an average of 26 frames per second in 1440p with a 1% 1 low of 19. Now that did mean that that game was absolutely stuttery and you simply would not have enjoyed playing it like that. So there was a mixed up bag of results when it came to benching the Radeon RX 5500 XT. Now the card did surprise me quite a lot, particularly on the things that I've been told about it. I told it was a very, very slow card that would barely keep up with anything previous generations of this, but it actually did exceptionally well. It didn't do fantastically well in games, of course, particularly when it came to those newer ones. When you actually started stepping up into the more modern games like The Last of Us, God of War, things like that, the performance actually suffered greatly. But of course, that depends how much you pay for these cards. This card actually cost us about £100, and as I said at the start of the video, it came like brand new. So for a card that is in near new condition, just for £100, you're actually getting a pretty decent buy. Should you go and buy an RX 5500 XT in 2023? The answer to that is probably no, and the reason is because it actually is starting to really see its limitations, particularly in a lot of those new titles. You can get cards for the same price as this, the £100 that we spent on it, maybe not as in good a condition, but you can get them, and they're much faster than these, particularly if you look at some of the Nvidia cards. So I would probably start looking there, but it is a nice piece to have around. Let me know in the comments below your experiences if you have had an RX 5500 XT. What did you think of them? Do you still have one and how well is yours performing in the games that you play? I'm going to keep this card around for a while because I think it'd be exceptionally good to include in some builds, particularly budget builds out there, and we can kind of compare the differences between whether you go for something on the Radeon 5000 series or something more on the Nvidia side. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of content, and I'm sure as always we will catch you in the next one.